local part of the show live from Newcastle. We'll be getting reaction, of course, to Jeremy Corbyn's leadership win from North East MPs who support him and those who refused to serve under him. Also, a year on from the demise of steelmaking, is enough being done to invest in low-carbon technology on Teesside? And we'll hear from UKIP's new leader, Diane James, as I asked if she has any real policies for the North. And with me in the studio to discuss all that, Philip Broughton, who was a candidate himself for the UKIP leadership, and Durham Labour MP, Roberta Blackmanwoods. Welcome to you both. Let's start, though, with Labour. Jeremy Corbyn has a new mandate from the party, a big one. But where does it leave all those MPs who resigned from his team, claiming he wasn't up to the job? Uh, Robert about Mudge, you were one of those. Yes, um, indeed. So uh, have you been approached to go back? Would you go back? Um, I want to see what Jeremy's going to do and how he's going to reach out to the Parliamentary Labour Party and to um, the members who didn't vote for him and the country at large. Um, I mean, I respect the fact that Jeremy has won this huge second mandate. I think it's really important that MPs don't seek to undermine him in Parliament. I think what the country wants and what our members want is for us to be the most effective opposition that we can be, and that means that we will have to get behind Jeremy. What would he have to say, though, to persuade you to serve in a shadow ministerial post again? I think that I want him to ensure that at least a large proportion of the shadow cabinet is elected by the PLP. I think that's what he needs to do to demonstrate um, that he's serious when he says that he's reaching out with an olive branch. I think we need to do that as well. But, you know, the ball is very much in Jeremy's court. He's the leader and he needs to set the tone and he needs to set the direction for it's, us. It's hard to, to sweep away the history of the last few months though isn't it with Labour MPs queuing up to say this man is unelectable, he'll never win an election, he's going to lead Labour to disaster and suddenly for them to appear in his shadow benches. Well what I'd say is that you know we all have concerns about Jeremy's leadership I hope he has heard those concerns, we'll have to give him some time to see how he reacts to what's happened in the, 12, in the last 12 months and what we want to see is a much more effective opposition and perhaps a clearer focus from Jeremy in reaching out to the wider country in the months to come. There will be quite a few MPs. You might want them, I don't know, who might be worried about holding on to their own job, not just the electorate, but with the Labour members in terms of deselection. Is that a fear for you? Is it a fear for others in the North East? I mean, it, it could be an issue, and I think that is one of the areas where some statements from Jeremy would be helpful. My view has always been that MPs should be judged on whether they're a good and effective MP, not whether they exactly agree with the leader. I mean, we don't want a, pol a party where we're all clones of each other. 40% um, didn't vote for Jeremy, so they need a voice as well. We are a broad church in the Labour Party. We have to remain a broad church, and that's what I want to hear from Jeremy. I want to but see him embracing everyone. Take a look and, and think, you know, some of those MPs massively disloyal to the leader that I supported. They're entitled to think, well, actually, I want somebody in there who's going to back Jeremy Corbyn 100% and not snipe at him. Well, I refute what you say because I don't think it's being disloyal to say that you've got some concerns and then to resign. However, I think going forward, it is really important that MPs do not seek to undermine Jeremy. He's got this strong second mandate, and I think that has to be respected. OK, uh, Philip Broughton, people have rubbished Jeremy Corbyn, I'm sure. Uh, many people in UKIP have, but I mean, look, and your new leader got 8,000 votes to become leader of UKIP. He got 300,000. Yes, but the point is Jeremy Corbyn is an absolute disaster. He is so left-wing, he's completely unelectable. And what I would say to people, and what I would say, absolutely in my opinion, what I would say to people is if you want a real credible opposition that can actually take the fight to the Conservatives here in the North East, it is UKIP. Jeremy Corbyn is a man who wants to cut the armed forces, he wants to scrap our tried nuclear defence, and he wants to borrow more money than the Conservative government has, which has doubled our national debt. Jeremy Corbyn would be a disaster for this country on immigration, on defence and on the economy. Well, yes, but at the end of the day, you've got one MP in Parliament, haven't you? Labour at least have got a decent number, even with the, uh, you know, the people who've kind of stepped back to have, be an effective opposition. It's ludicrous. Labour is the opposition, not you. No, what I would say is we, we are second in 120 seats across this country. I myself got the fourth best result in Hartlepool. We are closing in, and I'll tell you, we've got a by-election in Hartlepool at the moment in Headland Harbour Ward, and I think we've got a very good chance of winning that by-election, and that will show that UKIP is the real alternative, the real opposition to Labour okay. in the North East. All right, OK, well, we'll see. Uh, and we will be live at the Labour conference with a North East member of Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet a little later. 
Now, UKIP, as I mentioned, has got a new leader, but it's fair to say she's not yet a household name, nor has Diane James got many obvious connections to the North, where the party is determined to take on Labour. Well, this week I met up with her and asked her first about her Northern credentials. Yes, I do live in the South East. Yes, I don't have a Geordie accent. Let's, you know, let's be absolutely fair on me. But what I did make clear during my events was that I wanted to appoint two chiefs of staff. Two individuals, one, if you like, effectively looking after what I would call the South, if you want to split the UK on a regional basis, and one looking after the North. But much, much more important to that is to look at how do we identify and refine and define a strategy that appeals both to Labour voters and also to Conservative voters. You are the leader, much as Nigel Farage was associated with UKIP. You, you're going to be the brand. Yeah. And you are from the south-east of England. You are a Margaret Thatcher fan. That's miles away from the traditional Labour voters you have to win over in Hartlepool, in Sunderland, in Workington, isn't it? OK. Nigel, I believe, didn't speak with a Geordie accent. I don't believe he adopted a flat cap. I, you know, I'm a little, a little dismayed by the stereotype that you're trying to portray here. You know, I do, I can't fault where I live. What I am doing, though, is developing a party machine, professionalising UKIP, that's the, the plan, making its general election uh, ready with a manifesto, refreshed and such. And more importantly, we are the opposition party in waiting. And that is going to be my mantra. And if I surround myself with people such as John Fanana, brilliant MEP uh, for your region, and make more of his uh, skills and capabilities and abilities, that's how I drive the party forward. OK, well, you mentioned Jonathan Arnott. He and other UKIPers in the North East have drawn up this document, come out this month, a vision yeah. for the North East. Now, let's run through some of the things, because you, you, your campaign was a policy-free zone, so let's see if we can get you to commit to some. Um, so will you, as the document does, pledge to replace 100% of the EU funding that will be lost to the North East and Cumbria, hundreds of millions of pounds coming from the European Union to the North East, should all that money be replaced... Once we leave the European Can Union. I just remind you that that money originally came from UK taxpayers, went to the European Union, gets stripped out, a certain amount is retained by the European Union, and then we're lucky if we get, manage to get it back every here. Every reason so, is an opportunity to absolutely. To replace so, so therefore, they, your question is absolutely answered. The money isn't going to go to Brussels or Strasbourg or um, Luxembourg in the first place. It stays here, it stays within the region, it's there to be used by the local economies to develop so and every, really every contribute. Penny would be Absolutely. Why? Okay, I can't news. think of a reason why it shouldn't be. OK, all right. as the document pledges, would you also shift transport spending? That's, you know, so much is dominated by London and the South East, HS2, for instance, as well. And instead, dual the A1, the A66 and the A69 and improve regional railways in the North East instead. I would support anything that drops an HS2 white elephant and invests in transport infrastructure across the country. You've identified some key ones, which I've experienced for myself, by the way, by going up to the well, North East through my campaign. Do those. Would you do I, that? Would, I, would, I would certainly endorse exactly what Jonathan put in that document. He was identifying what is wrong with transport links in that part of the United Kingdom. He has got my complete and utter support to actually push that forward. New UK leader Diane James. Philip Broughton, I mean, you stood against her. Uh, you thought you could uh, widen UKIP's appeal in the North, target those Labour seats. Can she? I think Diane has a good chance of doing that, yes. I think what we have to do as a political party is we have to broaden our message so we talk about more than just Europe and immigration. We have to change our tone because I believe the way we say things is just as important as the words we use. And I would say to Diane, we've got to get on with the job because we've got a real chance here in the North against a Labour Party that is absolutely falling apart. But we've got to get out there and campaign as hard as we can and really be the party of change. But I suppose the danger is the opportunity could be lost. Because Nigel Farage, a big figure, everyone knew who he was. This is someone with Margaret Thatcher as her political hero. She believes in grammar school. Someone with insane instincts, I guess, a small government, low taxation. That's going to be a struggle to sell to traditional Labour voters. I think we're also the party that wants to protect the NHS, though. We want to stop the privatisation that was started by Blair, has been carried on by Cameron. You know, I would argue very much that we need a fair economy. We need to actually cut the tax on the lowest paid workers to actually help them get through the well, difficult economic times doing, we have. But you talk about speaking, to, I don't know quite what you mean. What do you mean by a different kind of tone? 
Well, what I mean is we've got to make sure we get our messaging right because sometimes I think people can get the wrong end of the stick with what they hear from UKIP. We have to be very clear. We have to communicate our message very and very focused. Well, give me an example of where you've got it wrong. Well, I think one of the one of the issues was when Nigel Farage talked about HIV during the general election in the TV debate. I thought that was the wrong tone. It was the wrong message. What we wanted to say was we believe in a national health service, not an international health service. But look, Richard, I'm very proud that I had the guts and the bottle to see this through and fight in the leadership contest. UKIP has an amazing opportunity, but we've got to do the right things. And I think we should have had TV debates. I think it was a big mistake that we didn't have TV didn't debates. Take part in any of those. Diane refused to take part in any of those debates. We should have had those debates. And also, the other frustration I had with the contest was that myself and the other leadership candidates were supposed to have a speech at the party conference. We were not allowed to speak, and I think that's wrong. Okay, all right. Um, Roberta, what more? It doesn't matter where Diane James comes from. Nigel Farage, of course, was hardly a northerner, was he? But it's the appeal they have. And the referendum proved that UKIP is more in touch, certainly on some issues, with Labour voters than you are. I'm not sure I totally accept that, but I neither think that we should underestimate the challenge that there is from UKIP. But ultimately, it's a very destructive and very divisive message. And I think Labour needs to be in our communities arguing for the jobs. We want prosperity for the North. I'm a bit worried about this North-South structure that UKIP are going to put in place. Sounds to me like they could give different messages to different parts right. of the country. We've seen that before. And we will be watching out for that but the important thing is that it's Labour that really stands for the NHS. We had all those promises during the referendum about additional money for the NHS from UKIP and elsewhere. It's not going to materialise. People will know that something has been promised that's not going to be delivered. UKIP's stance we on immigration keep... is much more likely to be uh, sympathetic for Labour voters than Jeremy Corbyn's. And I think Labour has a job to do in demonstrating the positive effects of immigration whilst at the same time saying that we do need some control. Well you say about divisive what is actually divisive about having an australian points based system which treats everyone the same everyone fairly everyone equally judges each individual on their own skills and that's and what labor introduced before we left uh, not, for EU immigration Absolutely. not for eu immigration i don't want to have the, uh, the, the uh, referendum debate again we'll have to leave it there so uh, moving on to other things and lord Heseltine has weighed into the debate over northeast devolution with a fierce attack on the region's council leaders here's that and the rest of the week's news in 60 seconds <laughs> Former Deputy Prime Minister Lord Heseltine says North East councils have blown the chance of millions of pounds of investment by refusing to bag devolution. The opportunity, the money, the scale of money that is available in the North East through the sort of arrangements that Manchester have adopted, Liverpool have adopted, the Tees Valley have adopted, has now been blown by the failure of the local authorities to agree. They've just thrown away a massive amount of money and opportunity, and, and I find that deeply depressing. Meanwhile, a new North East Devolution Commission is to be set up, chaired by former mayoral candidate Jeremy Middleton, to identify what powers could still be devolved to the region. And finally, plans for the future of maternity services at the West Cumberland Hospital will be revealed tomorrow as the start of a 12-week public consultation into the future shape of healthcare services in Cumbria. And you can see more of that interview with Lord Heseltine tomorrow evening at half past seven on BBC One when Inside Out asks him about the clean-up operation at the former SSI Steelworks in Redcar. Well, back to Labour now, and it promises to be a crucial week for the party. And our correspondent, Luke Walton, is at the Labour conference in Liverpool with the Shadow Cabinet member and MP for well, Bladen, Dave Anderson. Luke. In Liverpool for Labour is how to unite after a divisive leadership battle and to convince sceptical voters. Over the next few days, the conference will be debating issues like the cuts to Northern Councils, the state of the region's railways and devolution. But, of course, all of it is irrelevant if it can't convince voters that it is a credible government in waiting. Now with me is Dave Anderson. Hello. Dave Anderson, in terms of, of, of the members, they have overwhelmingly backed Jeremy Corbyn, but of course three quarters of Labour MPs have no confidence in him. That hasn't changed, has it? Well, I think it's changed. I think people have had a really, really strong message that the members 
know with the people we will be asking to help us get re-elected with the people who will ask us to go out on the streets not on doors convince people we're the right person to represent them as a community I think they've got to respond to what those people have said and it's a massive mandate he's got a second massive mandate in less than a year and if my colleagues don't get on board with that I don't know what they're going to do but we've had some strong allegations from North East Labour MPs the likes of Sharon Hodgson who've actually questioned Mr Corbyn's competence I mean those words can't be unsaid well, no, but they, get, they, they need to think again about whether there's any justification for them. I mean, what's, what, what has Sharon actually got to show that there has been any incompetence? What you look at is, we win elections, we just won an election in Chopper this week, a by-election, with 60% of the votes. You know, we won Maryland. 10% behind in the polls. Well, yeah, well, well, if anybody believes the polls, Luke, over what's happened in the last few years, the general election last year and the Brexit this year, then I think you can take most polls with a pinch of salt. We're belted behind in the polls. We spent the summer tearing each other apart instead of attacking the people who have got this country into a mess, the people who are making my constituents suffer, the people who have put us in a real problem with where we go with Europe. Our future as a, as a trading nation, as an economic powerhouse, is all at risk because of the failures of this Tory government and sadly because of the behaviour some of my colleagues will spend three months talking to ourselves. On issues like immigration and defence, aren't you actually out of step with traditional Labour voters in regions like the North East? They want a tougher line. You, you don't have that. Well, I don't think you're right on that. I think, I think it's very, very clear if you listen to people this week who have been speaking about immigration. We support immigration as long as it's controlled, as long as it's got um, people coming in with, with, with the skills we need on defence. We're having a debate within the party, specifically on Trident, about whether or not we, we, we devote our money to, to put and you know what none of us what we have to use or we spend that money on the public good. Roberto Blackman Wood speaking to the programme just in the last few minutes said Corbyn has to reach out particularly on this issue of MPs electing the shadow cabinet. Would you like to see that? Well I'm very very clear what's happened. The NEC decides the rules of this party. The NEC will come forward this week with a package to the conference which the conference will decide on. That can include members being uh, elected from the shadow cabinet. Uh, sorry Shadow cabinet members being elected can also possibly include a role for the membership in that and also a role for the leader to appoint some people. That's the way we go forward. We have a decision that's made by the people who we want to represent, who, who we say, please help me to get back into Parliament. If we don't respect their views, then we shouldn't be doing this job. Dave Anderson, thank you. So the next few days, obviously crucial to the battle and the future of the Labour Party. Back to you, Richard. Thank you, Luke. And Luke, we'll be talking to Jeremy Corbyn on tomorrow night's Look North. Now, almost a year after the end of steelmaking on Teesside, what are the prospects for existing and new manufacturing jobs? Well, the government points out it has a new industrial strategy it's drawing up, and it points to the success of big companies like Hitachi. But Labour MPs believe the government's failing to back crucial areas like carbon capture technology that could help create jobs. David McMillan reports. The dream is to score for the borough in front of the adoring Riverside faithful. The reality is these men would much rather be at the blast furnace. What you miss is uh, getting in a day-to-day -day or a night shift or whatever and having the, the crack and the patter with the lads. Most workers who lost their jobs at SSI UK have now stopped claiming benefits, but finding new, well-paid, skilled work is tough. The problem I've got is not really having the transferable skills because I'm not a plumber or an electrician. I've always worked in the actual steel making side of it. When you're applying for jobs, you just there's no um, replies. You don't get a reply from anything, and it, it becomes very frustrating. So how do you create the kind of skilled jobs these Teesiders want? Well, there's certainly no shortage of ideas. This week, the region's chemical and energy industry showed off plans for new technologies like hydrogen heating systems or turning waste into gas. The government can certainly assist by aiding us to invest in innovation in the region because it's the, it's the innovation that without a shadow of a doubt is going to drive the prosperity and subsequently the profitability of this, uh, of this sector. And there's one innovation many believe is the key to the region's future, carbon capture and storage. When these works were creating steel, they were also creating greenhouse gases. The amount of carbon or CO2 emitted in this region per person was almost three times the national average. Now emissions cost money and it's a problem Teesside's petrochemical plants still face. One solution could be carbon capture technology. That would see the CO2 caught and then stored safely under the North Sea.
Local Labour MPs certainly believe it's vital. This is an industry that is cutting edge. Um, Britain were leading the way in Europe in the research and development around this, but sadly government seems to be riding back on that. We could hugely reduce costs to some of the industries that we've got here, and we could be a, a global leader in that. The government cancelled a £1 billion competition to develop carbon capture technology last year, but research is still being funded on Teesside. Former Northern Powerhouse Minister James Wharton hopes it can work, but not at any cost. We can't put all our eggs in one basket. It's an expensive and so far still being developed technology. We've got the Teesside Collective. We've got great things happening here. And if it's going to happen and it's going to work, I'd like to see Teesside the place that does it best and benefits most from it. But we've got to ensure that we also look at a diverse range of other things, working to see what we can do to build on the success of having Hitachi on our doorstep, working to support some of our great exporting firms. Only recently we've seen firms like A.V. Dawson and Huntsman winning awards for their export work based in Teesside. We've got to have a very broad and flexible approach so that our economy is resilient into the future. James Wharton ending that report. We did hope to speak to Business Secretary Greg Clark, the man in charge of industrial strategy, as he was in Carlisle at a nuclear conference this week, but he said he was only willing to talk about the nuclear industry. Uh, Roberta Blackwoods, Labour MPs in Teesside in particular have been talking about carbon catches as if it's some sort of panacea, but actually the government's approach is the right one, which is to be slightly cautious about an unproven technology. Uh, yes, to invest where it's properly done, but not throw money at this. Well, what we know is manufacturing, and in particular the process industry, is really important to the northeast of economy we were at the leading edge of research in carbon capture and storage so we want the government to really be investing in this not just this we we also want to get a good deal on brexit from the government because 69 percent of our exports from manufacturing in this region go to europe so we need to ensure that those markets are still there and also the money for research that underpins some of the innovation that we need which is also linked to europe we need the government to they could right now say they're going to guarantee all of that money and that would help us build the new industries for the future. So I think I haven't got a minister here. Philip Broughton, I mean, you keep position on carbon capture. I have a look at what Roger Helmer said about a year ago. Is, as I understand it, it's a complete waste of money. Your party just wants to reopen coal mines. No, what we're saying is you've got to have a diverse economy. We're saying you should actually be supporting British manufacturing. You should be supporting a wide range of industries throughout our economy because we don't want to just rely on the city of London like the last Labour government did and like this Conservative government did. I, I didn't, there's not a lot. That's true. There's not a huge amount of policy on that area. And as I say, on carbon capture, which is something a lot of Teesside Labour MP say is vital for that area. Your spokesman on it said it was a complete waste of money and carbon dioxide was an irrelevance. But what we're saying is you should cut the green levies that this government brought in and the last government brought in. We should actually be helping businesses by giving them a business rate cut. We should actually be helping our industries to compete and we've got to take tax and regulation off them to be able to compete in a globalised market. OK, Roberta Blackwoods, um, we are around a year from the closure of Steelworks and yet most of those workers are off benefits. Yes, but what we want to see is a real investment in manufacturing um, for the future. What we don't want is to continue a low-wage, unskilled economy. We need a knowledge-based, skilled economy so that we can compete globally. And what we need to see from the government is some investment in the North East. We're still a massively underinvested in region, and the government needs to step up to the mark. We'll have to leave it there, because that's about it from us. More on the Labour Conference all week on Look North. We'll be back.